Okay, sounds good. Send me a message. All right, let's pray. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for these people who are here. Thank you for the fun that we're having. Lord, I pray that um, you would draw us to you, God, that we'd be introduced to you tonight in a new way, Lord. I pray that as we talk about the Holy Spirit um, and a pretty crazy dude named Phil, um, we'd learn something new, God, that, that you, would, you would intrigue our interest for who you are and what, and what you mean to us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so I'm going to dive right into this, okay, because I only got like 18 minutes left, 17. Dang it, man, if you guys had just told me three minutes ago, I would have been fine. Um, it's your fault. <laughs> just kidding. Little review, okay, so we're in the middle of this series. It's called Unstoppable. We're going through the book of Acts. Raise your hand if you've been reading Acts. You've been reading the book of Acts with us. Good. We're, that's probably, what, 40% maybe, okay? Um, that's pretty good. Hopefully, hopefully you guys are with us. I know my small group guys, they're like perfect. Everyone's reading perfectly, okay? Um, I just want to review a couple things real quick as we're going into the sermon this week, all right? Here we go. Number one, as we got introduced to the book of Acts, we were introduced to um, a, a, a person of God called the Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit. We learn in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit gives power and courage to all believers. Those who believe in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, he gives them power and courage. So we've been kind of walking through stories about how that has played out early in the book of Acts. Tonight, we're going to be introduced to a new story. It might even be the craziest one so far, okay? Last week, when Abel was preaching, he introduced us to, I like to call the chosen seven, okay? Basically, there's all these people. They're like, all right, we got we to gotta preach. They're called the apostles. They're the guys who knew Jesus, who are talking, uh, walking around teaching about Jesus, and then as the church grow, grew, there was more and more people who needed food and things like that, and the church loved, they were like, yeah, we're on that, we need to take care of the poor, but the people who were supposed to be preaching are like worrying about the poor, so they're like, we need to find seven people to help us worry about the poor so we can keep preaching, you remember all this from last week? So there were seven chosen, chosen, two of them, their names were Stephen and Philip. Stephen, right after he was chosen, walks out, does this like whole sermon thing, pretty cool little moment. Uh, amazing, like super, super long sermon found in Acts chapter 7, I believe. Yeah, Acts chapter 7, Stephen's speech. And right after he's done, he made all of the religious people really angry. So guess what they did? They killed him. Real sad story. Stephen's like filled with the Holy Spirit. Hey, back row. Put that burrito baby away. You know what I'm talking about. All right. So Stephen's out there teaching. He's, he's, he's like filled with the Holy Spirit. He must, does this amazing speech, and he makes all the religious people angry, and they pick up rocks and stone him to death. It's literally what's happened after chapter 6, chapter 7. Tonight we're going to be in chapter 8. Stephen, one of the seven who was chosen, gets rocks thrown at him until he dies. And by the way, while he's dying, whilst he's dying, for those English majors, whilst he's dying, he screams out the phrase, Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Is that what you would say why people were throwing rocks at you trying to kill you? No. Stephen's kind of impressive. Let's just throw this out there. But there is no, like, moment. Stephen dies. He's dead. It's over, okay? Literally, the next chapter starts chapter 8, okay? And we're going to pick right up here. So in Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4, here we go. And Saul approved of their killing him. Now, let's just pause right there. That's going to be really important, okay? This guy named Saul was standing there going, this is good stuff. I like it when we throw rocks at people and kill them. This is right and good. This is perfect. Saul. This is Saul. So Saul the Clapper, okay? That's what we're going to name him tonight. He's a guy who's just really excited about the fact that we're killing Christians. He's a Jewish leader. He's been commissioned by the Jewish leaders. He's, they've even sent him with letters. They're like, here's some letters. So if people get mad at you for stoning people, they know it's okay. Because the Jewish leaders said so. All right, here's your kill people letters. So he carried the kill people letters around. So we're going to stop there. We'll pick it back up on Saul. In a little bit. Uh, on that day, a great, so Acts chapter 8, verse 1 through 4, Saul approved their killing. Saul approved their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen, told you he died, and mourned deeply for him. But Saul, here's this guy again, began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged both men and women off and put them in prison. So, real quick, just a couple more things about Saul. Kind of important guy. We'll see more as we go farther. We won't talk about it too much tonight. Saul's an angry, passionate man. In any ways, he's kind of like an assassin, a hired gun for the Jewish leaders. Um, and basically, the Jewish leaders were like, we tried to tell Stephen and all the other apostles to stop telling the people about Jesus. We were nice about it. 
We slapped them on the wrist. We said, now go and don't say anymore. Well, they, list, they didn't listen. They kept saying more. So they hired Paul. He starts dragging people out, throwing them in prison. So Saul's, or Saul is like the, the assassin, the, the hired gun. Okay? By the way, he's, he's pretty good at this because what happens is the entire baby little Christian church gets scattered. So they hear that Saul's coming for them, and so they all run for the hills. Literally, it says that they were scattered, okay? Scattered all over the place. Now, let's stop right here. Now, maybe you're a skeptic in this room, and you're looking at this little thing, and you're going, this is fun. I remember we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about how he gave people courage and power. And I remember how we kind of set this up as the idea that the Holy Spirit was really unstoppable. That's what we named the whole thing. The whole thing's called unstoppable because we can't stop the Holy Spirit. So if that's all true, then why are Christians being killed and imprisoned? And why are they now all running for the hills throughout the region? That doesn't seem unstoppable, does it? Does it seem unstoppable? It doesn't seem unstoppable. Right now, you should be looking at this going, the Holy Spirit doesn't seem that unstoppable. People are dying. You'd think that if he could give them power and courage, maybe he'd save them from death. It doesn't seem that unstoppable. If that's your, what you're thinking, you're right. But you're only right for like 6.437 seconds. That's, I counted. That's a real number. I'm joking. I was going to make a joke about that's my 40 time, but that wouldn't be that impressive. Anyway, uh, the reason it only lasts 6.347 seconds is because look at the next verse. Verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Verse 8, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Here's what I want you to see. All of a sudden, Saul starts chasing the Christians all over the place. The Christians are running from the hills, probably because they think they're going to die. And all of a sudden, we're like, man, it doesn't seem that unstoppable. But here's the crazy part that happens. As soon as all the Christians get to their new places, what do they start doing? They start preaching the good news because the Holy Spirit gives them what and what? Power and courage. Thank you. You guys are listening. I appreciate it. At least one of you. Anyway. A power and courage. So the Holy Spirit takes these people, they're in new places, now they're preaching the word in this place called Samaria. By the way, if you know anything about the Bible, Jews, the basic religious system that, that all of this started with, those Jews, the Jews hated Samaritans. They were like mortal enemies. And here you have Philip, who's a devout Jew, going into Samaria, preaching the gospel. They're hearing about Jesus, giving their lives to the Lord, and now the whole city's full of joy. Is Saul winning? No. In fact, because Saul's persecuting Christians, now new cities are starting to hear about the gospel. Even places like Samaria where nobody would ever think the Jews would go. This kind of takes us up to our passage tonight. Here's how it's going to work. I'm going to read this passage. It's going to take me like three minutes because it's a little bit long. But you're going to listen because it's interesting. And when you're done, we got to talk about something that, you know, if you're mature, you won't laugh. But you'll probably laugh because, let's be honest, you're not mature. Uh, you'll see why in a second, okay? Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40, we're introduced to this guy named Philip. He's done in Samaria. There's great joy in the city. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts going, hey, I want you to do something else. Let's pick it up. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40. Here we go. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go south, go toward, man, it's hard to read lights. Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. He rose and went. Angel shows up and tells you to do something. You should probably listen. Let's just, let's just leave that there. Philip listens, okay? He rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come down to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he went and as he was riding, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. Again, so Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. And like a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe this generation? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say these things? Is he talking about himself or is he talking about someone else? 
Then Philip opened his mouth and began with this scripture. He told, them the, told him the good news of Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down to the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on, on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself in Az Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Okay, what the heck just happened? Why are we reading this? First, if you're going to understand what's going on here, let's talk about the eunuch. Okay, we got to talk about the eunuch. Maybe you're here tonight. Raise your hand if you think you know what a eunuch is. Does anyone think you know what a eunuch is? Is anyone tempted to giggle as they raise their hand? Okay, then you know what a eunuch is. That's good. Okay, I appreciate this. So, uh, how many of you guys have ever heard of the phrase circumcision? Does anyone know what circumcision is? Um, we're adults here. I mean, we're high school students here. Circumcision is when someone cuts the foreskin off of a penis of a baby, okay? You don't remember it, gentlemen, because, you know, you were eight, like, small. Back in these times, you were eight days old. Anyway, circumcision is not what happens to a eunuch. Something far worse happens to a eunuch. Circumcision is when you cut off the foreskin of a penis, a eunuch gets, shall we say, his huevos cut off. Plural. In case you're unclear on what I'm talking about, it's a plural thing. Two things, not a one thing, okay? Hopefully we're on the same page with this. Uh, here's why this is important, okay? In these times, this guy's a chancellor of the queen of Ethiopia. Um, this whole idea of like castration, cutting off the huevos was fairly common for his position because this guy was in charge of all of the treasury of Ethiopia of the queen and she wanted to make sure that he didn't get distracted and do anything else. So she cut off the things that often distract men. So he stays focused, okay? Now, I've done some research here. I just want to make sure that we were all understood what was going on here. So I found, I did some research. I found an ancient photo of, of the tools that would have been used for circumcision and for uh, castration. I want to put these up on the screen here just in case you're curious of what that would look like, okay? This picture was actually taken in about, about 2,000 years ago. Uh, we had to restore it with color. Um, you can see, though, you can see that to be a eunuch is to understand uncomfort, okay? And really, I know I'm being silly here, but the truth is, this is a real thing. This guy was in charge of a lot. The queen wanted him to focus on just that. So she took care of any distractions. You with me? Okay. Many times in, in African countries in these times, in ancient times, in Egypt, some of these places, oftentimes there, you, uh, the officials that would be overseeing things for the king or the queen would be eunuchs. So there you have it. Um, now you know what a eunuch is. Now you know um, that this guy is a devoted person to his queen. Um, but he's down in Jerusalem worshiping God, okay? So he may not have been distracted by some things that men are distracted by, but he's really interested and devoted to God. And while he's on his way back, the Holy Spirit says to Philip, hey, Philip, I, hey, Phil, I want you to go talk to this guy. You with me? Okay, now we're caught up. Now we can figure out what's going on here. There's three things I really want to make sure that we understand that's going on in this passage tonight. Very important for us. In fact, if you're here, I guarantee you, whoever you are, uh, there's something to apply here, Okay. First thing I want us to make sure we see here is that Philip listens to the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're going to unpack this for you believers here tonight. We're going to ask some questions in small groups like, how well do you actually listen to God? How well do you obey him when you know that he's, he's nudging you to do something, okay? He goes to Philip, he sends an angel, he tells Philip, like, I want you to go see this guy. Philip is listening as the Holy Spirit prompts him. You've got to see here that Philip is obeying, Okay. How many times have you been here and you're like, man, I just know God wants me to do this today, but you ignored it. You didn't do it. That's not what Philip is doing, okay? This is a great passage to remember, okay? I want you to imagine that Philip doesn't obey. Now, you're not going to understand why that's a consequence right now, but when we get to point three, I'm going to come back to this, okay? If Philip didn't obey, something crazy might happen here, but I want you to see first that Philip obeyed. Number two, I want you to see that the eunuch asked questions. The eunuch asked questions. This is really important. If you're in this room and you're not a believer, or maybe you're like, 
I think I believe, I might believe, but you still feel a little bit, bit skeptic, I want you to look at the eunuch, and I want you to kind of follow his example in the fact that he asked questions. So many, thi- so many people think it's not okay to ask. It would have been easy, potentially, for the eunuch, you know, Phil walks up, he's like, hey, do you know what you're reading? And the eunuch's like, yeah, I know, I know everything. I know, it's perfect. He had no idea what he was reading. He was trying to look cool, right? Yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I don't need you, but he didn't do that. He asked questions. Oftentimes, I find with teenagers, with adolescents, whether you've been going to church your whole life or you're going to church maybe for the first time tonight or the 15th time in the last whatever year, we're afraid to ask questions because we think for some reason that doubt is, is just not okay, that church expects us just to have faith, and that's, that's it. Just believe. Don't ask questions, okay? I want you to see that the, the Ethiopian eunuch asked questions. I want you to hear this. Doubt is inevitable. Doubt is or questions are inevitable. Wherever you're at in your faith journey, I want you to know that you're welcome here, and whatever your questions are, it's okay. Ask questions. It's important that you ask questions. It's part of the reason that we do small groups, okay? No question is bad. No doubt should be ignored. We want to talk. So if you're in this place here, and you're in your small group, whatever the case may be, you've always had a question, and you just wish that you could ask someone, just understand that here at Compass Church, at Compass Church Student Ministries, Our desire is to answer questions, whatever they are, okay? The Ethiopian eunuch asked questions. The third thing that I want you to see, this is pretty cool, is that you can't stop the Holy Spirit. And you're like, okay, yeah, you're right. Like, yeah, Saul, he, he, the Christians scattered. Okay, here's what I want you to understand. Check this out. You know what historical tradition tells us after the Ethiopian eunuch went back to Ethiopia? Tradition tells us that this eunuch brought the gospel to Ethiopia and the gospel spread all over that country because of this one man. This, this is true. History actually tells us this is what happened. This is, this, is, this is what we know happened. It's very possible that the very first missionary, the very first preacher in all of the country, of, on all of the continent of Africa was the Ethiopian eunuch. So Paul, I mean Saul, goes to persecute the church, sends them scattered, thinking that if, if, if we scare all the Christians, then, then they're just going to stop preaching. Well, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit sends Phil down to speak to this Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch. He meets him on a major highway. It's the only highway that leads from Africa into the Middle East at this time. In fact, all information that traveled in or out of Africa came through this road. Philip meets him on this road, and he goes down into Ethiopia. Remember the question I asked earlier, what would happen if Philip didn't obey? I want you to understand, Christian, all of Africa started to hear about Jesus because Philip simply listened to the Holy Spirit. What if he hadn't listened? What if he hadn't, what if he just said, nah, God, I, like, I I'm tired, I don't have time for that, or, or whatever. Today, 2,000 years later, the gospel of Jesus is still growing strong in Africa. And we may have just read about the very first moment, the very first person to tell anyone in Africa about Jesus. In fact, today, Africa is one of the fastest growing continents in the world where Christianity is, sp- is spreading. And we're talking about the moment that all, that all first began. You see, this passage right here on the surface seems like just a num- another passage in Acts. It's, it's just kind of normal, like, okay, Philip obeyed, and the Holy Spirit did his thing, yay. This is everything but normal. It's a subtle yet powerful display of the power of God in a follower of Jesus Christ that actually obeys him. You see, here's what I want you to see. Tonight, it's very simple. If you're a Christian in this room, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this. When you obey the Spirit of God, when you listen to God, when you obey him, there's no telling what he's going to do. And I guarantee you right now, Philip had no idea, had no idea what the Holy Spirit was doing, had no idea what the plan was. All he did was obey the nudge. All he did was go, okay, God, like, if this is where you want me to go, I'm going to go. And by the way, I think it's pretty cool that at the end, Philip's like dunking him. He's like, do-do-do, baptism. Did you guys catch that? Like, in the text, it says, after he baptized him, Philip was gone. The Holy Spirit carried him away to another city. 
Never happened to me. I mean, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. If it did, I'd be like, what just happened? Like, what do you do with that? Was I dreaming? Wasn't I just dunking a eunuch in the water? Like, did I hold him too long? Did I get arrested? Someone hit me in the head? Like, what just happened? The boldness that Philip had to obey the Holy Spirit, the power that the Spirit of God gave him to move and work. But it's because he obeyed. So here's my question for you as we dismiss. Maybe you're in this room tonight and you're a Christian. You've been a Christian for a long time. If you are, um, this talking about the Holy Spirit is nothing new to you. So my question for you is this. What is something that God has been drawing you to, to do that you haven't done yet? Who is someone perhaps that God has been nudging you to talk to about your faith in Jesus that you haven't done yet? And maybe if you're here tonight and you're not a believer and, or, or, or you're just kind of struggling with doubt and skepticism, tonight in small groups, I'm just going to tell you right now, we're going to give you a chance to ask any question you want. And if your small group leader can't answer it, you just come talk to me afterwards and I'll try and answer it. You come talk to Abel and he'll try and answer it. Look, tonight the challenge is simple. If you're a believer in Jesus, I want you to consider following the example of Philip. When the Holy Spirit nudges you to move, you, nud you, you follow. Because you never know what God's going to do. And if you're in this room and you're a skeptic or you're not a believer, then I want you to follow the example of the eunuch. I want you to ask questions. And in small groups tonight, that's what you're going to be challenged to do. Let's pray. God, thank you for this time. Um, thank you for all these people. Thank you for the chance that we had to open your word. I pray that, that as we continue through the book of Acts, God, that you would truly introdu introduce us to the power of your spirit. God, your Holy Spirit is still alive and active today in, in those who love and follow you. I pray that this would inspire us and, and challenge us to consider what you want to do in our lives, God, what, you want, what, what you're trying to give us boldness for, what you're trying to give us power for. Lord, and if there's anyone here tonight who doesn't know you or is curious about you or, or maybe doesn't want